Lord God, as you spoke long ago through the voices of your prophets, speak to us here, speak to us now through the power of your spirit in the words from the story of Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats that were at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and he taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but we have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knee, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On their way to the church to get married, a young couple gets in a fatal car accident. They find themselves sitting outside the pearly gates waiting for St. Peter to process them into heaven. When he arrives, they ask him if they could go ahead and get married in heaven. St. Peter said, "I, I don't know. This is the first time anyone has asked. Let me go find out. So the couple sat and waited for an answer, and they began to think, if they were allowed to get married in heaven, should they? But with the eternal aspect of it all, if it doesn't work, are they stuck in heaven together forever? And a month passed, and more. St. Peter finally returned, looking somewhat bedraggled. Yes, he informed the couple, you can get married in heaven. Great, said the couple, but we were just wondering, what if things don't work out? Could we also get a divorce in heaven? St. Peter, red-faced with exasperation, slammed his clipboard on the podium. Oh, come on, he said. It took me three months to find a priest up here. Do you have any idea how long it'll take to find a lawyer? Yes, St. Peter at the Pearly Gates is a rich vein of comedy and jokes. St. Peter himself is rarely the subject or the butt of these jokes. He's really more of a stock character in a stock setting. So I really appreciate this cartoon. The use of St. Peter as a comic prop may obscure his role as one who does indeed carry the keys to heaven or the keys to gospel life. Here are a few images to remind us of his large place in salvation history. The one on the left is an ancient piece of iconography. The one in the middle is a detail from stained glass. And the one on the right 
in statuary is Peter in front of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. St. Peter holds the keys because Jesus says, and I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The guy of the statue is also the same Peter for whom two books in the New Testament are named, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, which are letters attributed to him, but their true authorship is disputed. It is this same St. Peter who is considered the first pope and who died by crucifixion upside down. This is the same man who was arrested by Herod for his work to spread the gospel after the day of Pentecost, was sent to jail, but was released by an angel. Before that, Peter was the first to see the resurrected Jesus. Peter makes a confession of love toward the risen Christ three times there on the beach, because it was before that when Peter denied Jesus three times after telling him he would never do so. Earlier than that, Peter witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. He watched Jesus bring the dead to life, declared Jesus the Messiah, and then told him to shut up about it. It was before that that this same Peter saw Jesus walk on water and tried to walk on water himself, but failed. And before that, Peter was a fisherman when he was still called Simon. He was also called Simon Peter, Simeon, Simon Cephas. Peter fished commercially in partnership with his brother Andrew and his friends, James and John. The hymns say that these were happy, peaceful fisher folk but fishing was part of a complicated web of local economies at the time. And we know that rewards and pitfalls of economy do not always bring peace. Like most fishermen of his time, he and his partners used linen nets. Linen is not translucent and fish can see the nets during the day and avoid them. Therefore, fishing of this type was done at night. And it is after a night of fruitless or fishless labor that we first encounter Simon slash Peter in person. It is possible and indeed likely that Jesus had met Simon before. An earlier chapter of Luke tells us that Jesus went to the house of Simon's mother-in-law and cured her of her fever. But Jesus doesn't really know Simon. And that morning, as fishermen are cleaning their nets after a night at sea among the hills of Brown, Jesus is walking along, trying to find a place where he can do some teaching and preaching. Perhaps because I am feeling a little socially worn out, a little fragile, I want to imbue Jesus with some social anxiety too. Perhaps he's feeling vulnerable and shy, looking for some connection, some wisp of familiarity when he sees Peter and with a little relief mixed with hope, he says, hey, Let's push out to sea in this thing and see what happens when I use it as a pulpit. Because I am feeling a little needy and a little lonely also, I want to attribute Peter with some longing. Otherwise, why would he say yes? He just got off work. He doesn't need to pay attention to Jesus. Not only that, his work was not rewarding or profitable. He came up empty handed. The last thing he needs is a social encounter with a stranger. He doesn't 
really know Jesus, but something, and I think it's desire and longing, compels him to make the connection. And he scrambles in the boat and takes the teacher out where he can be heard. Just two guys in the same boat. When he finished teaching, Jesus said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. Okay, dude. Peter fishes for a living. He's a pro. He's good at it. He has done his work, is doubtless tired, frustrated, irate for not having anything to sell for profit, any stock for families to purchase for their meals, or any food for himself. But okay, Mr. Educated Temple Guy who knows nothing about fishing, tell me again how to do my job. This is the ultimate did you try turning it off and turning it on again? Obvious advice. And yet Peter does it. He takes them to deep waters. And the course of Peter's life takes the first of many turns as a follower of Jesus, as a main character in heaven jokes, as a denier of Jesus, as the first to see as the rock of the church, a man whose heart was brimful and broken. Why did Peter agree to try again in the daylight hours when the chances of finding fish were even lower than the abysmal night before? Why do we do the things we do? How do we decide to pay attention to say yes or to say no. When we are as truly human as Peter, how do we know when to do something divine? I don't know. But in this story of encounter, I find both relief and challenge. It's a relief to me, because even when we are unproductive, frustrated, irritated, and empty, insecure, vulnerable, and shy, there is a wisp of sacred connection that can still be made. In our strange days among the hills of brown, we are awash with longing and desire. How little would it take? What small impulse could we follow to get into somebody's boat for a few minutes, even if we don't really know them. This story is a challenge to me because these connections, the profound and the superficial, the sacred, the collegial or intimate connections can lead us to deep waters where the course of our own lives may change in as many ways as Peter's changed. Peter, who found himself knee deep in fish, but had not enough faith to walk on water. Peter, who was impulsive and foolish, who betrayed Jesus. Peter, who yet was the same man who loved Jesus completely and saw the risen Christ as the path to the marvelous peace of God. Our destinies are not likely to be recorded in iconography or stained glass, statuary or cartoons. But our destiny is no less important because it is commingled with God here on the shoreline and in the same boat with relief and hope, desire and longing. Pay attention, push out to deep waters, and welcome the divine. Amen. <laughs>